Have you ever sat down to write the next scene in your novel and you just felt bored by it? Uh, you can't think of anything to make it dynamic or exciting. And if you feel bored by it, well, chances are your readers will too. Well, in this video, we're going to talk about six simple questions that can help you find the magic in that scene. This process is not going to take you a lot of time, but it is going to help you make sure that every scene in your novel keeps your characters on their toes and forces them to make consequential choices. Hi, I'm Jane Kalmus, and today I'm going to plan a scene for a prospective mystery novel. A couple of months back, I made a video in which I laid out the entire process for planning a cozy mystery, and in that video, we planned a book in which a woman who can see ghosts finds herself on an island resort populated by a whole lot of them. And she winds up having to dig into a mystery about the past while also solving a crime that takes place in the present. So today we're going to lay out a scene from that book and the tool we're going to use for this is my scene planning worksheet. It's got six questions and we're going to see how those questions help me take a scene from the first germ of an idea to something I'm itching to write. All right, let's imagine how our book would begin. Our heroine is named Peyton and she's at this island resort because her wedding is scheduled to take place here in just a couple of days. The resort has a lot of ghosts because back around the turn of the last century, it was a sanitarium for tuberculosis patients. So a lot of people died here. So I imagine in the first few scenes, we'd introduce Peyton and she'd begin to be aware that the place is packed with ghosts. During this time, we'd also introduce Peyton's chronic issue, which is that she badly craves social acceptance. But in order to get it, she has to keep her ability to see ghosts a secret, especially from her rich, controlling parents and her stodgy, unimaginative fiance. However, the ghosts will quickly pick up on the fact that Peyton can see them and one of them decides to latch onto her as the best opportunity to investigate a mystery from the island's distant past. So let's plan a scene from fairly early on in the action where this ghost actually approaches Peyton for the first time and tries to get her to take the case. The first question on our planning sheet is, what does Peyton want in this scene? She has to have a goal. She can't just be experiencing this book. She's got to be driving it. She's got to be making things happen. And I think her goal is definitely going to be to get this ghost to leave her alone. Okay, because she doesn't want to be involved. She doesn't want to keep talking to ghosts. She just wants to get on with her nice, normal, totally non-supernatural wedding. Question number two is, does she get it? But here's the rub. The answer to this second question can never be yes or no. It needs to be either yes, but, or no and furthermore. Okay, this is a little trick I picked up from Jillian Wheat in her book, How to Write Killer Fiction, and I think about it every single time I plan a scene. I did a whole video on this, which I'll link down below, but basically, let's look at the four possible answers we've discussed and then ask ourselves, well, what's wrong with yes or no? Well, what's wrong with yes is that it is simply too easy easy. Peyton gets what she wants, the plot moves ahead, and it all feels just a little linear, unsurprising, unsatisfying. We don't feel like she's really having to work very hard. Okay, what if we change that answer to yes, but? What could go wrong here? What could be a price Peyton has to pay for pursuing this goal and getting what she wants? Well, maybe she convinces the ghost to stop asking her for help, but in doing so, she makes the ghost really angry at her. Now this ghost is going to be bent on ruining her wedding by playing a bunch of poltergeisty tricks. Okay, then let's talk no. What's wrong with no? Well, if Peyton says, I don't want to help you, and the ghost simply says, I won't accept that, well, then nothing has changed in this scene. It is a non-event. We might as well have just skipped it. The ghost will still be petitioning Peyton later. They'll have another scene that feels like a boring repetition of this one, and the whole story will feel a little saggy and dull. So let's look at how the scene would change if the answer was no and furthermore. Maybe Peyton's unable to convince the ghost to leave her alone and furthermore, well, someone could see her talking to the ghost and get weirded out. Uh, maybe she could get mad at the ghost and throw something at her and damages something valuable. Or maybe she accidentally gives the ghost information that can be used against her later. And just to drive this point home, we're going to go ahead and label the rows on this little table. The top row is called without consequences and the bottom row is with consequences. And this is what this question does for you. It keeps you driving for consequences. It makes sure that when your character makes a choice, there's fallout. There's a change in her situation based on the action she took. Now, I don't strictly force every scene to have a but or a furthermore. You guys know that I love my spreadsheets, but I never want to rely on them to the point where everything feels samey same and formulaic. Sometimes it's enough for your protagonist to have a close call with a consequence, or sometimes it's even enough for them to just get into a scene, 
pick up the necessary clue or asset and not have any consequences at all. But I still think about this question for every scene because in general, consequences are a good thing. They mean that the choices your protagonists make are consequential. They have weight. I love this question because it helps me twist my protagonist's world up tighter and tighter with each scene, getting her deeper into the soup and keeping her situation always changing. Okay, I think the answer to does Peyton get what she wants is definitely gonna be no. In this scene, it's made clear that the ghost simply will not leave her alone until she provides help. And as for consequences of this scene, well, I like this first one. Someone sees her talking to the ghost and that's because it's really gonna play into Peyton's chronic issue regarding social acceptance. But I do wonder if I can amp that up, make it more consequential somehow. Maybe her fiance could see her and it damages their relationship. Uh, maybe her mom sees her and begins hovering over Peyton in subsequent scenes, monitoring her behavior and making her investigation almost impossible. Yeah, so I think I'm gonna go with that one. I really like the mom Peyton difficult interaction. All right, this scene between Peyton and the ghost is gonna be a pretty dialogue heavy scene, which means we need to roll right into question three, if dialogue accompanied by what activity? And this is a question that really, well, it does two things for me. One, it keeps the scene kind of visually interesting. It prevents it from becoming a talking head scene where we hear what two people are saying to each other, but we don't have the sense that we're actually seeing them. And two, it prevents me from having my characters do some very unnatural emoting. Uh, I remember in the first book I wrote, uh, which I did not publish, my characters were always glaring or snarling or leaping to their feet in order to show their emotions. And that was because I haven't, I hadn't, given them anything. I hadn't given them any props. So maybe if a character was really mad, he'd pick up a book from a nearby desk and slam it down. And these, these are all very unnatural ways of showing your emotions. But if I had given my characters props to work with, if I'd put objects into their hands, they'd be able to show their emotions much more fluidly. It's weird to pick up a book simply to slam it down, but it's much more natural to angrily peel the potatoes that you are already making for dinner or to pick up your chess piece and place it on the board with a very pointed flourish. So when I'm choosing an activity, I like to choose things that will involve objects. I also like to choose things that will allow my characters to compete with each other or otherwise get out their aggression toward each other. It doesn't have to be a game. Uh, even those potatoes I mentioned could allow the characters to compete, each determined to peel more than the other. So finding an activity for this dialogue scene it's gonna to be tough because one of our characters is annoyingly non-corporeal, which means there's not much they can do together. So actually, actually they could play chess together if Peyton moves all the pieces, but I don't think they're chummy enough to do that. I think I'm gonna put that in my back pocket for a potential later scene, but I think what's best for this one is if I give Peyton an activity she's trying to accomplish and the ghost keeps interfering. So maybe Peyton is trying to finish some embroidery on her wedding dress. Uh, this can com connect back to her issue about wanting acceptance. You know, maybe the embroidery on the gown is the one part of the whole wedding spectacle that is really kind of authentically her style. And she's kind of taking a risk by insisting on putting this little flair of her own personality into the planning for this very swanky wedding. But it kind of speaks to the fact that although she craves social acceptance, she also has a need uh, to be seen for who she is. And there's a tension there that this scene is gonna let us dial in on. So Peyton will be struggling to finish her embroidery and the ghost will keep interfering. She pops up through the fabric, scares Peyton. Uh, maybe she causes her to prick her thumb with the embroidery needle. Uh, maybe Peyton's thimble rolls under the bed and the ghost can go looking for it. So this sort of thing just keeps them active in the scene. It gives Peyton an additional reason for being annoyed and it gives me some opportunities to insert humor. If you're enjoying this video and you feel like it is giving you some useful tips, please take just a second to smash the like button. And if you just did that, thank you so much. I am looking to reach more writers and create lots of good practical content that simplifies mystery writing. And those likes, well, they really help. And then let's talk about question four on my spreadsheet. Question four is just labeled to keep in mind. And this is kind of a catch all space where I list anything that this scene absolutely has to have. If there's any clues, any foreshadowing my scene needs, any setup, here's where I note it so that I don't forget to work it in somewhere while I'm writing. The other big thing that I note here is character introductions. If this is the first scene for any character, I want to be sure to give that character a big 
intro. Let the readers kind of start to size her up and have some emotions about her. Um, I did a whole video about this one where I talked about how Hagrid's introduction in Harry Potter is the best character intro of all time, and I'll link that below. In this scene that we're planning, I don't think we have any clues to drop, but we do have a character intro. We've probably seen our ghost floating around in an earlier scene or two, but this is the first time she's really center stage, and so she's got to get some special attention. And for character intros, I have another seven questions that I like to ask myself before writing. So getting into each of these is kind of beyond the scope of this video, but for now, let's make sure to give our ghost a moment of humanity, something that makes us empathize with her and begin to connect with her. So obviously we know she's distraught about the mystery she wants Peyton to solve, and that probably has to do with her own death. But how can we really bring that home and make the reader empathize? Well, we could have her describe the moment of her death, something frightening but not too graphic, something like feeling an arm close around her from behind. Uh, this could be something that really gets Peyton's attention and makes her actually start wanting to help. Or maybe what's better, uh, maybe we could have her decline to share this experience with Peyton. Perhaps she wants to tell Peyton about her death, but it's just too traumatic and she can't get through the description of it. That would make us feel really the same kind of empathy for her, but we wouldn't be jumping these characters into too much intimacy early on. We'd leave them a space to build from. And I think that's definitely what I like for her moment of humanity. And while we're talking about her, um, let's go ahead and name this ghost. Uh, so I figure she died around 1920, which means she was born around 1900. So I'll just load up the website for the Social Security Administration. Uh, this is my go-to whenever I'm naming a historical character because it has a list of most popular names, most popular baby names by decade going back to 1880. So as long as you're writing a book set in America and you're not going too far back, this is a big help in nailing the right feel for a historical character names. So Dorothy, Hazel, Louise, oh hello, Minnie, yes, Minnie the ghost. Minnie May? No, Minnie. The next question we're going to address is what strategies the characters use to get at their goals. Peyton and Minnie both want something. Minnie wants help and Peyton wants to be left alone. They aren't just gonna argue this point back and forth. As the scene goes on, they are going to escalate. They're each going to try new, more intense tactics to get what they want. Uh, this is going to force both of them to think on their feet and make decisions in the moment. When Minnie busts out a new tactic, Peyton has to think fast in order to come up with a counter for it. It's also going to make sure tension rises throughout the scene. So what is Peyton's first tactic going to be? Well, I think she's just going to try to ignore Minnie. La la la, I don't talk to ghosts. And Minnie's first tactic will be to make herself too much of a nuisance to be ignored. This is when she'll start interfering with Peyton's embroidery, maybe passing her ghostly hand through the fabric or otherwise making it impossible for Peyton to concentrate on what she needs to do. This is gonna force Peyton to think up a new tactic. And I think she'll plead helplessness. She'll say, look, even if I wanted to help, I wouldn't know where to begin, but Minnie knows that Peyton is her best shot. No one else around here can talk to Gus. So she's not convinced by this act. So here, all Minnie has to do to counter Peyton's tactic is just to offer Peyton a clear way that she can help. Minnie knows where an old storeroom is that might have some information about the people who stayed here when Minnie died. So Peyton's last tactic got her nowhere. And now is the time when she's gonna pull out all the stops and just level with Minnie. She'll tell her that Minnie is going to wreck everything for her if she keeps hanging around. Peyton's family is gonna figure out that she's seeing ghosts again, they're going to react badly, and perhaps even her fiance will find out and it could disrupt their marriage. At this point, I could see two obvious strategies for Minnie and which one she chooses is going to really change their relationship. She could strong arm Peyton, either you help me or you best believe I'll cause problems for you. Or she could offer to help Peyton. If Peyton's not so sure about her fiance, well, if she hasn't, think he'll stick by her if things start to get ghosty, well, maybe Minnie could do some spying for Peyton. She can float into the fiance's room when Peyton isn't there, find out how he really feels and help Peyton feel more sure that he's the guy she hopes he is. Uh, I don't really want these characters to be at odds. I want them to develop a friendship. So I'm going to go with the second one. I really love planning out scenes before I start writing the draft because it helps me make final decisions about character and plot. So we just saw two different possibilities for how Minnie would behave in this scene and those affect her character in a pretty big way. Is she sweet and helpful or is she kind of a bruiser? Making all these decisions ahead of time helps me limit revision and that is great because revision is the one thing I like the least. 
All right, the last question in my scene planning spreadsheet is final note. And this is just a place to write down the note on which I want the scene to end. What's the final paragraph about? How is the scene going to pull the reader along and make them eager to turn the page and find out what happens next? To me, this is all about sort of dwelling on what has changed because of this scene. How has the protagonist's situation changed? How will things be different in the rest of the book because this scene happened? And this is actually easy, okay? We already decided that Peyton's mom would come into the room at the end of the conversation and see her interacting with the ghost right at the tail end of their conversation. So all we have to do here is just to decide how Peyton will take it, what she'll be thinking as we bring the curtain down on this scene. And to me, it's gonna be dread, pure and simple. She's terrified that her secret is out and that it is going to spell trouble. So hopefully this little exercise helps you see how a scene that could have been simply a straightforward discussion has instead kept our characters active, forced them to be clever, and created a fallout that will linger and affect the plot from here on in. At the end of it, Peyton is left with a bleeding thumb, a perilous social situation, as well as her new obligation to the ghost. If you want to see the video where we planned out the entire plot of this cozy, I'm going to put that up on the screen here. It's going to take you all the way through the planning process for a cozy, developing the hook, planning out plot twists, clues, and suspects, and arriving at a finished outline for a novel.